This is Robert Kaplan from the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. This is a podcast series about great power rivalry in an age of global demons. If Russia continues to interfere with our democracy, I'm prepared to take further actions to respond. Cyber attacks on the United States, economic coercion. The United States does not have the qualification to say that it wants to speak to China from a position of strength. How will conflicts between the United States and China and between the United States and Russia interact with pandemics, climate change, massive cyber attacks, state failures, and other terrors of a global media age? You'll want to listen closely to the breaks because you might be one of the lucky listeners to receive my latest book, The Good American, The Epic Life of Bob Gersoni, the U.S. government's greatest humanitarian, as part of a giveaway. With us today is General Philip Breedlove, former Supreme Allied Commander of Europe and NATO, and an Air Force General. It's a great pleasure to welcome him here. It's an honor. Let me just jump right into it with the first question, because we will have a lot of ground to cover. General Breedloff, NATO was created in 1949, and the Cold War ended exactly 40 years later in 1989, for all practical purposes. And at the time, a lot of voices saying, what will NATO do now? That was 32 years ago. NATO has actually existed in a post-Cold War framework for almost a third of a century. If we got together in a few years, we'd actually be able to say that the Cold War was only the first half of NATO's existence. So obviously, despite all the criticisms, NATO must be doing something right to stay relevant. You know, and it might be a bit of bureaucratic inertia, but that would only be a part of it. So why don't you take us into how NATO has evolved in the Cold War and particularly after the Cold War? Thanks, Bob. And first of all, thanks to uh, FPRI for putting this on. I think it's an incredibly important topic as we're about to go into the NATO summit. And then shortly thereafter, possibly a summit between our new president and President Putin. And let me just say uh, rather boldly up front something that I've been saying now for uh, several years, that I actually believe that NATO now is more important than it's ever been. And if we have time, I would love to talk about why I believe that, because it is an important assertion. And NATO has evolved, not to take you back in history, but young Captain Phil Breedlove first went to Europe in 1983. And even though I was a fighter pilot, I was serving with the U.S. Army for two years as a JTAC, as a Ford air controller on the ground, as an airborne battle captain in OH-58 Kiowas. And I was on the inner German border before that wall came down and staring across to the north into the Fulda Gap, where 2nd Brigade 3rd ID's mission would have been to charge north into that or defend if attacked in that column. And so young Phil Breedlove, Captain Breedlove, started off in that height of the Cold War where that Warsaw Pact OMG operational maneuver group was seen to be as the greatest threat to Central Europe. I served through the end of the Cold War. My wife and I actually were driving to the Czechoslovakian border to get some crystal because we were about to move back to America. Thousands upon thousands of these little smoky cars headed west on the Audubon. We were east of Nuremberg and we had to find an American channel to find out what was going on. And when we found an English channel, it was AFN out in Nuremberg and the guy was screaming, the wall is down, the wall is down, the wall is down, the wall is down. I don't know how many times he said it, but we finally figured out that life was changing in Europe. And so as the wall came down, NATO began to change in a way that was worrisome. And that was everybody, including our country, was taking huge peace dividends, drawdowns in force structure, drawdowns in basing. It was really a rush to reap that peace dividend. Ergo, when I took over 
as the secular, we were facing some more drawdowns. If you remember what was going on in the summer and fall of 2013, I, I became the secular in the summer. President Obama was looking at a big drawdown in Afghanistan, and I thought that was going to be what dominated my time as the SACUR was what was going to be the new NATO force structure and U.S. force structure in Afghanistan. And as we changed from the combat role to the sort of nation building supportive role in helping Afghanistan to get on its feet. And the way that we would draw that down was a bit worrisome because we saw that many in NATO were looking at a second round of peace dividends and drawdowns in their militaries. And frankly, I and other leaders in NATO were concerned that NATO would correct too far and that we would not then be able to meet our obligations under Article 5. And if all don't understand what Article 5 is of the Atlantic Treaty, that is the collective defense article, meaning if one is under attack, we are all under attack and we all come to their defense. We went through a period of trying to discuss with the nations what we would do as we came out of Afghanistan. And my military leaders around me at SHAPE all convinced the civilian leadership of NATO in the NAC in Brussels that we needed to have a series of exercises and self-examinations to determine Can we do our collective defense job? We've been in Afghanistan for so long doing counterinsurgency. We had lost the skill sets. We had lost the command and control capabilities. We had lost the transportation capabilities and the intelligence capabilities needed to do a large force fight, which would be required by Article 5. And so we planned the Trident Juncture series of exercises, and we got agreement from most of the nations in NATO that they would not further draw down their forces until we determined were we in a good position to meet our collective defense Article 5 requirements. And then, frankly, it was prescient because shortly thereafter, Russia invaded and occupied Crimea. And then a couple of months later, invaded and occupied the Donbass. And that sort of settled the question about whether we should be drawing down forces or not. NATO has gone through a change from ready to fight the Warsaw Pact, post 9-11, counterinsurgency for almost 20 years, ending and drawing down in Afghanistan, re-examining itself, deciding it needs to be ready for large force employment again, And then Mr. Putin invades Ukraine twice. I want to give you time to answer this, General Breedlove. Why is NATO more important now than ever? Because I think, you know, what that assertion follows from what you just said, in a way. I take two tacks in answering this. First of all, we have an opponent that now three times since 2008 has used their military force to change internationally recognized borders in the Eurasian landmass. They invaded Georgia and still occupy South Ossetia and Abkhazia. They've invaded the Crimea and still occupy the Crimea. And they invaded and now uh, set up their proxy forces in the Donbass of Ukraine. What we find is we have an opponent that has demonstrated He's written about it and talked about it, but he has demonstrated three times that he will use his military once again to change internationally recognized borders. And so we have the same problem now that we had in the Cold War, where we were facing the Warsaw Pact. On top of that now, Bob, just think about what is happening to America in this new sphere of battle, which some call hybrid war. I call war below the lines meaning war below the lines of kinetic response. And now we face a Russia that uses all of its elements of national power. I'm a fighter pilot, so I use a very simple model. It's called DIME. Diplomatic power, informational or disinformational power, military power, and economic power. And examine what Russia did to Ukraine to discredit the Poroshenko government to discredit the Maidan, or as the Ukrainians call it, the revolution of of dignity. Information campaigns, disinformation campaigns, 
And then economically, think about that winter and the next winter of 13 and 14, when Russia cut off heating oil, raised the prices on heating oil, recalled loans on energy, and used every tool in the book economically to put pressure on Ukraine. Here we have a country that has demonstrated it will use its military, and now it's using all the elements, broad spectrum of tools to attack in this new hybrid war or gray zone war, whatever. We have an opponent that has demonstrated that it will take bellicose action in much broader terms, even then during the Warsaw Pact days. And so I believe that a credible, a close-knit alliance to defend now is more important than ever. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, General Philip Breedlove will fill us in on the little known truth about why the Black Sea has become such a point of contention between NATO and Russia and its geopolitical implications. This podcast is sponsored by the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia. Founded in 1955, FPRI is committed to producing the highest quality scholarship and expert analysis through the lens of history, geography, and culture. For more information about FPRI and our work to educate the public on the most pressing foreign policy issues of the day, please visit www.fpri.org. General, does Ukraine at the end of the day, though, matter more to Russia than it does to NATO and certainly the U.S. because of geographical proximity? And if it matters more to Russia, won't they be willing to take more risks than we would? Isn't this a kind of imbalance? The two short answers are yes and yes. You're absolutely correct. I mean, Mr. Putin has demonstrated that he will take rural scorn. He will bear up under layers and layers of sanctions. He'll do anything required to keep Ukraine from coming to the West. It does mean more to him obviously, than it does to the West, because look at how little the West did to help Ukraine when it was invaded. I mean, we really fell short of the mark, in my opinion, of what we could have and should have done to at least change the path of the future rather than what we have now. Is NATO's strategy designed to keep Ukraine independent and neutral? In other words, would NATO and Russia be satisfied with neutral status for Ukraine? And I mean it informally. I mean, it would never be declared as such. You know, Ukraine would always be so-called independent. But the idea of kind of drawing Ukraine into the West, is, is that a no-go? Let's go back to what you said at the very first. And I'm not being critical because I do believe that in NATO and in U.S. European Command, There's a lot of work being done to advise our leaders on how we could help. In fact, when I was the SEC here, my predecessor, Jim Stavridis, had the foresight to start a program we call the Military Commission. So this statement I'm about to say is not critical, it's just factual. I'm not aware that we have a strategy for Ukraine. We have a lot of thinking and we have a lot of work we have done and we have offered several things that we can and will do. But to say that we have a strategy to bring Ukraine into the West, I don't think that's a correct statement. So we need to start from what we do, I believe, want is a Europe whole, free, and at peace. And we do believe in the sovereignty of the people of Ukraine that they can self-determine where they attach themselves. What we don't believe in is allowing any belligerent country to hold a veto which, as you see, the veto in Georgia has been in place since 2008, and now the veto in Ukraine is in place since the winter of 13 and and spring of 14. When you look at Georgia and Ukraine and Crimea, what you're seeing is the greater Black Sea region. Given that Vladimir Putin has said 
that the collapse of the Soviet Union was one of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century or words to that effect. And all these regions like Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, where Russia has also been active, they are, you know, they're all part of the former Soviet Union. So has the Black Sea become like a real zone of contention between NATO and, the, and, and Russia? Bob, you're so prescient, and, and I thank you for this softball. You don't know, but I actually am chairing a small group that is a spinoff of MEI, Middle East Institute, and that group is called Frontier Europe, and it is focused on the Black Sea because the Black Sea is an incredibly geopolitically important place. First of all, the Black Sea is Russia's road to the Mediterranean and to the south. The Black Sea is an area where, just like from the Caspian Sea, they can employ long-range precise strikes, just like they did from the Caspian Sea into Syria. The Black Sea is incredibly important to Russia, and Russia has militarized the Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea to a point now where it is a very strong, what we call A2AD, anti-access area denial location whereby they can bring surface to surface, surface to sea, and surface to air fires into much of the region of the Black Sea. And so the Black Sea is a contended area. And we have, as you know, great NATO allies in the Black Sea. Turkey, which we're having some issues with now, but a great ally in the South. Romania, which has become a new sort of stalwart ally of the United States and NATO, in the Black Sea. And of course, Bulgaria, which struggles because it is so dependent on Russia for things like energy and other things, but yeah. it struggles to remain a strong ally, but it is under immense pressure from Russia to try to splinter them off. I know that um, Bulgaria and Russia, they share a linguistic affinity similar, whereas the Romanian language is so different, it's been hard for Russia to penetrate Romania. Romania also has oil and gas of its own, not a lot, but some, so it's less dependent on Russia than Bulgaria is. We've talked a bit about the, uh, the Black Sea. What about the Baltic Sea? Pardon me if I will sort of rephrase what you just said, because when I think of the region, I'm really thinking of the Black Sea because it is a conduit for Russia. And we have nations around it that are at threat in a big way. When you talk of the Baltic Sea, I think more of the Baltic states. And yeah. the threat to the Baltic states is more over land than from the sea. As you know, the two northernmost Baltic states share a long border with Russia. And just to the east of them is Piskov, which is a Russian base which has their most offensive most rapid deploying, error mobile offensive force in their, in their military. And they've placed it literally about 40 minutes flying time from the capitals of the three Baltic nations. So in the Baltic, we think not so much of the threat from the sea, although that is a threat. Hmm. But what we think more about there is the threat across land and the way that Russia has positioned its forces so near that border to frankly send a message and intimidate and to prepare them well if they wanted to, to make a rapid approach to the Baltic nations. We're going to take a short break. Stay tuned. If you're enjoying the Global Demons podcast, you'll also enjoy Robert D. Kaplan's latest book, The Good American, a sweeping yet intimate story of the most influential humanitarian you've never heard of, Bob Grissoni, who spent four decades in crisis zones around the world. Thanks to our sponsor, Random House, you can win a signed copy of The Good American just by listening to this podcast. All you have to do is subscribe to this podcast and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. We will have a random drawing and announce the winner on our 13th and final episode. To shift gears a little bit, and again, an historical question. For the last third of a century, NATO has been involved in expansion. 
First, it was, you know, the countries of the former Warsaw Pact, like Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, etc. NATO had to absorb their militaries into NATO. And then there are countries which came along later, which are much weaker, like Mont- Montenegro and Albania, which had to be absorbed. How is absorption gone when you, when you look back a third of a century? between where we were in 1989 and where we are now? You may have to remind me because I want to answer a different question first. Okay, fine. Get there, And then we'll talk about the absorption piece. I'm always jabbed with this expansion thing. And frankly, we have to have intellectual honesty and understand there's two sides to every story. And Russia sees this very different than we do. They do see us expanding. And they feel like they were promised we would not expand. I want to go back to something I said about Ukraine. First and foremost, we believe in the sovereignty of these nations. We believe in the sovereignty of the Baltic nations who have twice won their independence from Russia. And we believe that they should have the ability to choose their own association into the futures, be it west, south, north, or east, whatever it is, it's their right to choose their associations and how they align themselves in this world. Second, as the uh, SACUR, I attended almost every meeting NATO had and all the summits and all of the ministerials from the military ministerials, defense ministerials, foreign ministerials, summits, et cetera. And while the actual meetings are rather scripted in things, at every one of these ministerials, there is a dinner at the end of the first night that is truly the one free-for-all of the whole meeting. And in that meeting, all of the tough subjects are, are talked about. And in all the other meetings, most of the delivered messages are scripted. They're approved by capitals. They're very politically aligned with nations, et cetera, et cetera. But at the dinner, people get to talk rather freely. And it's almost all every meeting I was in, the open door policy was discussed. Remember when I was a SAC year, we were still at 28. They've grown now to 32 since I was. And I won't mention her name because she is still extremely prominent in world politics. But I remember a very poignant statement by one of our most illustrious female politicians or political leaders one night when the, when the conversation had turned yet again against or not wanting to or slowing down expansion or whatever. And this individual basically, and I'm just not going to use the language because I'm protecting people and sensitivities, but it was like, Well, if the blanking door is open, then somebody's got a blanking walk through it. I bring this up because I watched for three years how hard it was for a nation to get into NATO, how many hoops they had to jump through and all the things they had to do to get into NATO. So this business where people believe that NATO is out there clawing and trying to pull people into NATO and grow towards Russia and get bigger. And and let me tell you, it could not be more opposite of that. The nations that want in fight and fight and people fight for them to try to make it happen. So I really get sort of peaked if you can't tell here. Well, if you had only knew how hard it was, you might understand this a little differently. How has the expansion gone bureaucratically and organizationally? Are these relatively new militaries in NATO post-1989 members? Are their military contingents in NATO of the same caliber as the West? Are they better in some cases? You know, generally, how has the quality coefficient of NATO handled this? So this is a good news and a bad news story. There are shining examples of how well nations have come forward. At great risk, I would name a few things. So I'm not going to name all of them, but I want to point out a few. For instance, the cyber center and the cyber capabilities of Estonia is phenomenal. And they are leading in this business. And they've written a book that is really quite well. And so we have nations, other Baltic nations have stood up the NATO JTAC, Joint Tactical Air Controller School, and they turn out 
incredible people. And so each of these nations have some have done some things extraordinarily well. Now, there are a few of these nations that are still flying Soviet aircraft and are still using extremely aged Soviet ground material. Sadly, Afghanistan has helped a great deal in that because nations that went to Afghanistan had to bring the forces they were using in Afghanistan up to standards in equipment, communications, tactics, techniques, and procedures. So, uh, Bob, I'm skirting your question a little bit. It's a mixed bag. Uh, okay, we, we're now in an age of, uh, of what has been called great power rivalry. U.S.-Russia, U.S.-China, with China and Russia moving closer together, which in terms of the atmospherics is a warm strategic alliance, but which may only be a tactical alliance because they have tensions between themselves as well. How does NATO posture for this? In other words, if there's a real danger in the Indo-Pacific, in Taiwan, for instance, or someplace, do NATO forces help out there or quite the reverse? Do they alleviate some of the burden off U.S. forces in Europe? In other words, what's the NATO reaction as, you know, evolving NATO reaction here? Few know how much NATO's nations really are, were already involved in the Indo-Pacific. So one of the first weeks I was on the job, I was taking a situation overview of our uh, command and our forces and where they were deployed and so forth. And RIMPAC was going on in the Pacific. And RIMPAC was going on. And I noticed that we had nine, nine NATO nations back in 2013 sailing in RIMPAC. And I asked my commanders, I said, why in the world do we not have a NATO flagship down there and exercise that nine nation contingent under NATO rules and get some training out of it and show the world that NATO is here because nine, let's do it one more time, nine of 28 nations were sailing very capable craft in RIMPAC. And so the NATO nations have long understood the requirement for the free navigation and freedom of trade and goods and passage in these waters. And they were demonstrating it with forces, money, and exercise. So the answer is, NATO is waking up to the fact that China can affect things that NATO hold dearly. And oh, by the way, Bob, this whole business of the new passage along the north, the northern passage as the ice recedes, is going to be a big deal. China wants to be an Arctic nation because of what will happen in that water. And Russia is seeking to exert their dominance. So, Uh, I'm a little off subject, but the bottom line is uh, NATO is adapting by participating. They are showing their interest by being there. I don't like the concept that people say, uh, well, you NATO, you just focus on Europe and then let us take care of uh, Asia because those nations have their own sovereign concerns about Asian waters. And how would that be for us to say, don't worry about that. We'll take care of that. I mean, that That doesn't work all that well for me. So I think that what we're going to see is a NATO that is focused on Russia because Mr. Putin continues to invade nations and occupy foreign lands. Um, But they are also going to be concerned about their ability to conduct commerce freely in the Asian area. Well, General Breedloff, thank you so much for participating in this podcast. Thanks, Bob. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Global Demons podcast brought to you by the Foreign Policy Research Institute. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts and visit our website at www.fpri.org. For the Foreign Policy Research Institute, I'm Robert D. Kaplan.